sense, uh, some of the best work in the world on auditory MRI is being done by people from Maastricht. I thought I would talk about the language work that's going on in our lab today. But uh, before I did that, I thought I'd kind of give an inspirational video. This is uh, uh, brain activity um, in response to movies. I won't be talking about this today, but it's kind of a nice demo. Uh, you know, we've got a brain here. Uh, it's got a bunch of voxels, a couple hundred thousand voxels that we're measuring uh, blood flow in. And um, of course, the brain is inconveniently folded up inside the skull. So if you come from my lineage, which is David Van Essen's lab, the first thing you do is you think, well, I have to flatten this thing so that I can look at all the brain activity. So you computationally uh, segment out the surface in FreeSurfer and then use our visualization software to inflate the brain and flatten it out. And then you can zoom in on one hemisphere, say here on the left hemisphere. And these small little outlines you see on the video are actually the edges of the voxels. Uh, they've now been warped because the brain has been unfolded. And we can overlay uh, in white here the ROIs that we know about. Uh, here's the auditory ROIs down here. This is the visual system in the back on the right. This is the motor and somatosensory strip. And you can see as people are passively watching this movie, they're fixating on a small spot that's not shown here. Um, the brain activity is changing quite dramatically all over the brain. Here in the visual system, you see sometimes you get more activity, sometimes you get less activity. But it's not only in the visual system. You see changes in activity up here in prefrontal cortex. People are doing some task. We don't know what the task is, right? They're just watching these movies. Uh, and uh, the job, my job, as uh, an experimentalist is to try to find some relationship between these x variables, which are my task or my movies, and these y variables, which are these 100,000 points I measure on the surface of cortex. And so really, this is just a big, gigantic, multiple regression problem. And um, there's a lot of ways to solve multiple regression problems. You know, if this system is nonlinear or non-stationary, it's going to be hard. But still, it's, it's potentially doable. It's just, it's just a system identification problem. And it's fairly straightforward in theory. Uh, it's just a question of whether you can get enough data to actually solve it. So that's kind of uh, what my lab does. Uh, today, I thought I'd talk about work we've been doing with uh, language processing. We started this work a few years ago as an outgrowth of our work looking at semantic representation for visual stimuli. And then we, we had these great models and tools, so we decided what other system can we, can we look at. And if you're working in humans rather than animals, then uh, one of the things you naturally think of is the sort of neuroethologically valid um, task for humans, which is language, where humans are, are language animals, right? So we started looking at uh, language, and we use these stories called the Moth Stories. This is a radio show on uh, American National Public Radio. It's basically a stand-up storytelling. People get up and they tell these autobiographical stories about their lives. There are amazing stories. You can get this online. I encourage you to go listen to these stories. They're really fantastic. Subjects love being in this task. They just lie in the magnet and they listen to these stories. Um, Uri Hassan has used these stories for several years. He's had great luck with them. So uh, we collected some MRI data, pretty generic MRI for the most part, except for our pulse sequence. Um, and now we have to model the data. And the data are uh, essentially a list of uh, stories, which of course we have the sound pressure waveform and we have the individual transcriptions of the stories. And we have some brain activity. So the first thing we need to do is build a model. And of course, if you think about how stories are represented in the brain, they're probably represented at multiple scales. There's going to be some spectral information that might be represented in the cochlea and the uh, subcortical nuclei. There's going to be some uh, phonemic and articulatory information uh, that's represented somewhere in the brain. There's going to be some syntactic information that's represented because although few of us can actually explain the syntactic rules of our native languages, we all generally follow them, so we have some implicit knowledge of syntax. And there's going to be semantic information, which is essentially information about the meaning of the stories. And that's going to be on a short time scale and a long time scale. On a very long time scale, there will be narrative information that's represented in the brain. And of course, all this information is represented somewhere, probably multiple places. And we don't really know. We don't have very strong priors on where all this information is represented. So uh, in our strategy, what we do is we take the individual stories and we project them into feature spaces nonlinearly that reflect these different kinds of features. So there might be, say, 500 spectral features, 50 uh, phonemic and articulatory features, maybe 50 syntactic features, and some semantic features. And now uh, we have, say, 2,000 features. And for each one of these features, we uh, estimate a finite impulse response model, uh, essentially that tells us about the hemodynamic coupling between the individual feature and the brain activity. So for each one of these 2,000 features, we're essentially um, modeling how the presence of that feature in the story changes the blood flow. OK, so that's the modeling uh, stage of things. Oops. Now um, we need to validate the model. 
And so to do that, we collect a second data set using different stories. And now we have the new stories and some brain activity. We take the stories, we project them back into the feature spaces, and we multiply them times our model, and that gives us a prediction. And then we can compare the observed brain activity to the predicted brain activity. So this is essentially just cross-validation uh, using a fit set and a test set. And this allows us to get two things. For each voxel and for each feature, we get statistical significance. Was the, are there a random relationship or not between the feature and brain activity? And it allows us to get importance. We can say how much of the variance in brain activity does this model predict? And that's something actually you can't get out of resting state and you can't get out of, uh, say, a decoding approach like uh, MVPA because you, uh, you have to have essentially a prediction of the brain activity in order to estimate the noise ceiling. And that turns out to be a really critical thing. So eventually, you're going to decide that you're done with modeling. You might, you might play a lot with these models. You might you know, work on models for weeks or months. And eventually, you're going to get tired of that. You're going to want to publish a paper. So then you'll go and start looking at your data. You might uh, look at the individual voxels to look at the tuning for a voxel, just as if it was a neuron. Of course, it's millions of neurons. Uh, you might collect all the voxels together and look at the coding space that the entire system codes in. Or you might project the voxels onto the surface of cortex. And um, I'm just going to show you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to bypass in, uh, an exploration of the low-level models um, because I think we've, we're, the people uh, actually at Maastricht, Elia and uh, Francesco and their collaborators are doing a much better job than I'm ever going to do of actually looking at low-level auditory information and spectral information. So I'm not going to talk about that today. They've done a great job with that. Instead, I'm going to talk about these two higher-level features, syntactic features and semantic features. Now, if you're looking at syntax and semantics, there's a huge literature going back 100 years uh, that's a theoretical linguistics literature on how the brain uh, might represent sort of syntax or semantics. The problem we have when we try to use those models to fit to actual data is it's very difficult to take a sort of theoretical linguistics model and map it onto just a body of text. And so it turns out to be much more efficient to take a computational linguistics approach to this and just uh, use a statistical learning rule of some sort to extract the semantic and syntactic information from the story. So that's essentially looking at the covariances between the words. For example, you might see I was drinking, and that would be some sort of subject verb object segment, and that might have its own little state in a, in a syntactic model. And you might look at the fact that eyes and skull and hair occur a lot over a large number of stories, which means that they might relate in their meaning to some sort of uh, semantic concept. So uh, we fit two models, a syntactic model that's actually a hierarchical hidden Markov model that recovers individual syntactic states and the transition probabilities between them from text. This is using a corpus of, say, six or 10 billion words of text. And then you can uh, extract uh, a latent semantic analysis model, which is essentially um, a covariance model. And this is the one I'm going to talk about today, so I'll explain it in just a second, uh, just for a second. Uh, we have 985 target words. These are the most common words in the English language, excluding boring words like the and a. Uh. Uh, and then um, we look at the covariance of these words in a large corpus of billions of words of text. And we use those covariances as our feature space. So words are being defined in terms of the presence of other words. And that's kind of what you have to do if you're going to look at semantics. So now we can uh, take both the syntactic model and the semantic model. We fit to every voxel. And we can project the predictions of the models onto flat maps. So here we have the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. And this is just uh, raw prediction values. Um, scaled from 0 to a 0.7, which is about the best correlation we get. And red means locations that the syntax model fits well in. Blue means locations that the semantic model fits well in. And white is uh, locations that both models fit well. This is auditory cortex here. You notice neither one of these models fits well in primary auditory cortex because that's where the uh, um, spectral and phonemic model fits well. But in uh, higher order auditory cortex, sort of on the uh, ventral side of the temporal lobe, um, you, or, or more ventrally, you see that both models fit pretty well. And there are a lot of other locations. Here's the temporal parietal junction. The syntax model seems to fit well. Um, there are a lot of locations where one or the other of these models fit very, very well. Now, our syntax work is still in progress. It's kind of uh, taken us quite a while to get a syntactic model we were happy with. And I don't really have a lot to say about that beyond showing you that it kind of works. So let's uh, spend some time looking at the semantic model. Now, uh, when you do these kinds of experiments, you have a problem, which is you have way too much data. So if we have, say, five subjects or seven subjects, each subject has 
say, 60,000 to 100,000 voxels in their cortex, and we have 985 features. So each subject's data is very, very large, and we have to do some sort of dimensionality reduction. Of course, the first thing you always think about doing is principal components analysis. So when you do PCA on these individual data sets, you find out that it takes somewhere around, say, 80 principal components to account for about 95% of the variance in an individual subject's data. And now you can compare the principal component solutions for different subjects because the principal component spaces are just vector spaces and they're going to align across different subjects. And you can look to see which principal components are correlated across subjects. And when you do that, to make a long story short, you find out that all the subjects in this experiment share a low, say, five or six dimensional space uh, of a semantic space that describes how these stories affect uh, the how the, how the uh, semantic model is distributed across the brain in the individual subjects. So if we have a low dimensional semantic space that all the subjects share, that seems like an interesting target to try to understand semantics. So we take all of the data and we group that together. We do principal components again so that all the subjects are now in the same principal component space. And we take the first few principal components and we look at them. So the principal components of the, of the voxel data are essentially mediating. They're mediating between the features the uh, syntactic and semantic, fe the semantic features that occur in the stories and the brain activity data. And so we can visualize what's going on by projecting the features, the semantic features, into the principal component space or by projecting the uh, voxels into the principal component space. So first let's look at the features. These are just the first two PCs out of the five that all the subjects share. And uh, in here we've got the 985 common words that are projected into the space. And you can see that the first principal component, which is along this axis, distinguishes between words like victim, innocent, murder, uh, convicted, child, uh, mother, confessed, and words like, uh, really boring words like intricate lighting. Uh, I'm, I, I can't see these. I'm not wearing my glasses. Where are my glasses? <laughs> I apologize. I have a bad case of old. Atmosphere, clouds, stream, landscape, scenery. So this is, uh, this is the axis that, most, that is most distinguished in the brain activity of subjects when they're listening to these stories, right? And you can go through all the principal components. They, they kind of make sense. Uh, not all of them are completely intuitive, but, but uh, the space is organized in a meaningful way. That's not the really interesting part, though. The interesting question is what happens to these principal components uh, when we project the voxels into the space? So to do this, we uh, take, say, the first three principal components, and we assign them to the red, green, blue channels of uh, the, the, the monitor, and we assign each voxel a red, green, blue assignment based on the voxel's projection into this principal component space. And then we plot them on flat maps. And so that's shown here. Um, so I've got the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. Here is the folded up brain. If you are a, a folded up brain person, I'm not. Um, if you look at these maps, they're very, very rich. Here's primary auditory cortex, the temporal parietal junction, the precuneus. And you see there's a, a strip of fairly complicated, semantically selective voxels uh, going along the strip in a very rich pattern. And if you look in prefrontal cortex here, you see that the pattern is, is quite complicated. There are little domains. There are pink domains interleaved with green domains. It looks like maybe this is a repeating pattern. There are some blue blobs here. There are, there are maybe some pinky blobs up here. It's complicated. There's some left-right asymmetry in this particular subject. Uh, the reason I like these maps, they're difficult to interpret, and I haven't tried to interpret them yet. We'll get to that. But the reason I like these maps is for two reasons. A, semantic activity, in other words, brain activity that projects onto the semantic model um, is represented broadly across huge swaths of cortex. And B, prefrontal cortex, which for those of you who uh, do neuroimaging or, or other work in the prefrontal cortex, you know is very difficult to parcel out into more than say three or four or five different areas, seems to, be, uh, seems to consist of a rich distribution of areas. So that's kind of exciting because it means we might be able to use these stories to try to understand more about prefrontal cortex. The trouble is, as you all know, brains vary. So here's five individual subjects. Uh, they're all modeled in the same principal components feature space. They're all modeled with the same semantic model. Um, and you can see that they look kind of similar, right? All of the subjects have uh, a swath of um, semantically selective cortex between auditory cortex rolling up uh, through parietal over to the precuneus, and they all end up with a swath in prefrontal. But the exact distribution of colors and the exact distribution of gradients is different for every subject. And, and this makes perfect sense because, as you all know, uh, brains vary. 
This is um, something from uh, one of Brian Wendell's old papers that uh, shows that even primary visual cortex, here shown in purple, as I recall, um, is highly variable across individual subjects. In fact, if you sort of look either using MRI or, or postmortem histology, the size of V1 varies by up to, say, 300% across individual people. So um, the projection, the size of the areas, the projections onto the folds are going to vary across individuals, and this presents real problems for any kind of group level analysis. Now, the normal way to try to deal with this problem is to uh, kind of use a brute force solution. So, for example, you might take MNI coordinates, the Montreal Neurological Institute coordinates, and you take all the individual brains and you uh, perform an affine transformation on the brain to morph it, essentially linearly or nonlinearly, if you are uh, very ambitious, into the MNI coordinate system. And then you uh, do all of your work in the MNI coordinate system. Now, in principle, there's nothing wrong with this, but in practice, it's lossy. And it's lossy because the sulci that you see in any individual brains don't always appear in MNI. So, for example, here in color shows the surface of the MNI coordinate brain, and you can see that there's a big genetic sulcus here that uh, does not exist in the MNI brain because when the MNI brain is made, it's made by averaging over 1,000 people. And if this sulcus is variable across people, it just disappears. The sulcus disappears. And then when you try to do modeling, what's going to end up happening is if you project everything into MNI coordinates, um, essentially the individual data is going to average out across subjects. And averaging data, in, averaging data is always a bad idea. Um, it's the, always the last resort. It shouldn't be the first resort. Um, optimal averaging is acceptable because that's denoising. Blind averaging is always the wrong thing to do. So we don't want a blind average. We need a better way to do this that doesn't uh, cause us to lose data. So um, if you're an anatomist, one thing you might think about doing is doing surface-based alignment. So this is David Van Essen's method. Uh, it used to be used in carrot software. Now I think it's uh, mostly uh, free surfer being used for this. Um, you extract gray matter. And now you, uh, you have the surface of the brain, and you inflate it, and you kind of morph it into a brain-shaped beach ball. And then you take all the different brain-shaped beach balls, and you just line them up optimally, and, and you call it a day. You declare victory. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing this. It's actually much more sensitive than just converting everything volumetrically. But it has a problem, which is the mapping from the brain-shaped kind of inflated beach ball into a sphere is not deterministic. It's heuristic. It's done kind of a back of the envelope way. Um, it's an optimization problem. And since it's an optimization problem with unknown ground truth, then you can't really solve it very well. You just do the best you can. And that implies and suggests that you once again are going to be averaging and you're going to be losing data. And we don't want to lose any data. We want to preserve every single bit we have in MRR because it's mostly type 2 error after all. All right, so uh, we worked on this for about five years uh, in my lab, and we never averaged data over subjects because we could never find a good way to do this. And last year, a uh, graduate student of mine, Alex Huth, came up with a, a brilliant way to solve this problem. Um, he said, look, let's not, let's not think of this as uh, a standard uh, discriminative model where we, you know, we want to find the mean brain and the variance across brains in terms of the actual distribution of the brains themselves. What we should think about is that this is a really a generative modeling problem. What we want to do is come up with the underlying sort of platonic probability distribution of brains that emits individual brains as samples from the probability distribution. That's a generative modeling approach. And if you have such a generative model, it means that you can find uh, commonalities across brains without actually ever mapping the brains into one another, without ever finding a common coordinate system, because everything gets operated on in the probability space. So the way this is implemented is uh, kind of as a, as a Boltzmann problem. Uh, we have essentially Think of it here on the right. Um, this is, uh, say, a platonic ideal model um, where the brain consists of a bunch of areas that simply tile the brain. Like pepperonis on a pizza, the whole brain is just tiled with these areas, and each area has a different semantic selectivity uh, conferred here by its color. Now, we can take the center of each area and count those as balls, and we can map them over here, and we can connect all of the balls with springs. And now we can uh, change the spring tension, which is just the floppiness of the springs, and we can change the length of the springs and, we can, and so on in order to try to solve an optimization problem across brains. So what happens is we fit the ball and spring model to one brain, and then we uh, map it onto all of the other brains in our sample, minus one, such that the balls and springs are as similar as possible. Now we have these uh, little X's on here. The, these little X's are essentially pins. These are the centers of functional areas that we derive by uh, using localizers. So it's a completely independent data set. And those are used just to keep the ball and spring model from flopping around all over the brain. Okay. So now um, in this model, what's going to happen is the spring lengths 
the spring constants, which are the floppiness of the springs, um, the number and semantic tuning of the individual areas is going to be shared across all the subjects. What's going to be different across the subjects is the precise locations and shapes of these semantic areas in an individual subject, because those are going to come from the probability distribution. So this shows the thing settling. Here we're beginning, you notice, in a, in a, in a neutral state. And now um, each iteration through the, the loop, we uh, can calculate the semantic selectivity of the uh, area by just looking at the underlying functional data. And you can see, here's the balls and springs moving around as the thing settles. And here is the area's shapes changing as the thing settles. And eventually, this will converge. And um, there are some hyperparameters you have to fit. The most important one is how many areas do you want? And so you do grid search for that. You try one area, two areas, four areas, and you use cross-validation to try to determine how many areas you need. So uh, this is the kind of data you get out. Um, I should emphasize that when you do this, you fit the pragmatic model to, say, if you have five subjects, to four of the subjects. And then you take the last fifth subject and you discard all of the story semantic functional data. And you only have the anatomy and the functional localizers that provide the pins. And you give this brain to the pragmatic model. And it infers where it thinks the area should be based only on the anatomy and based on the probability uh, of this distribution of semantic areas across all the brains. And that's shown here on the left. This is the left is the uh, solution for one brain. And on the right is the functional data for this individual subject. And remember, none of this functional data was used to fit this model. Right? So this is, this is the least possible overfitting you can do. Right? And if you notice, this is uh, actually quite a good correspondence. Here's precuneus seems to have a, a dark spot and a red spot. And here's a dark spot and a red spot. Here's a, a, a yellow thing and a green thing. Here's a yellow thing, uh, maybe a, is that a green thing? OK, there's no green thing. It's not perfect. There's a purple thing. There's a little purple thing. OK, it looks pretty good. This is qualitative, right? So, uh, so this looks promising. It looks, it's obvious that this is not random, right? Here's some orange stuff down here. So here's some orange stuff down here. OK, so now um, we can actually calculate the likelihoods of the model given the uh, data. And we do that by leaving each subject out and then fitting the pragmatic model to the remaining subjects. That gives us a pragmatic model. We then take the likelihood of the pragmatic model given the actual observed functional data, and we can compute these likelihoods over here on the right. The red is a high likelihood, and the blue is a low likelihood. You can see that generally the likelihoods are very high, meaning the model fits fairly well. And when you see a blue spot, like this blue spot here, the reason this occurs generally is that there is a small functional area that is predicted to be in a slightly different location here than it actually is in the brain, where it's actually moved up here. So what's happening is this model that has none of the functional data to support it is sometimes misplacing areas. It gets, uh, generally does quite well, however. All right, so now. Um, we have, there's one more step of this, which is you go through and you remove the non-significant areas, because the pragmatic algorithm assumes that the system is going to be tiled with, vis with semantic areas. Um, a bunch of the brain is not semantic. Early vision is not semantic. The motor and somatosensory strip is not semantic. So you throw out all the stuff that doesn't reach statistical significance, and you end up with a model like here on the right. So uh, when you do this, um, this is the pragmatic model. You can see that uh, it fits a lot of areas. It fits areas in both the left and right hemisphere. It fits tons of areas in the prefrontal cortex and here in temporal parietal junction and auditory cortex. If you actually count the areas, you see that it comes up with about 60 to 65 areas in prefrontal cortex, which is a remarkable number given that usually we functionally or anatomically divide prefrontal cortex into, you know, at most eight areas, right? Uh, temporal parietal junction, we get around 20 areas. The precuneus, around 10. Altogether, we're getting about 110 new functional, uh, largely new, often new, uh, semantically selective functional areas, ROIs, out of this pragmatic model from this one experiment. Now, um, the next thing you might want to do is say, you might say, well, OK, so they're semantically selective. What do they do? And this is a problem. This is a, a longstanding problem that every neurophysiologist is familiar with. Uh, I have a 985-dimensional tuning curve, and I want to understand what my system is tuned for in this 985-dimensional space. That's, that's difficult to deal with. So one of the first things you oftentimes do when you have this kind of data is you say, look, I just want to find the peak of my tuning curve. I want to find the stimulus that would evoke the largest response from my system. So we can do that. We can go through for each one of these semantically selective areas, and we can identify, say, the 10 words that the pragmatic model predicts would elicit the largest amount of brain activity. And that's shown here. 
So I'll direct your attention up here to the right. You notice this area pre-Q4 uh, is predicted to evoke the highest brain activity to husband, wife, daughter, father, son, mother, married, whom, husband's daughter. So it seems like family relationships. This precuneus area nearby is home, hotel, house, school, campus, in college. So that seems to be place related. Uh, here's a sort of abstract precuneus area, memories, moments, sadness, dreaming, tomorrow, excited, dreams. Uh, you see things that are related to uh, numbers, 5, 10, 3, 4, purchased. You th see things that are related to material properties, thin, cloth, leather, waist, inch, sleeve. Uh, I would notice that down here uh, in, um, this is uh, essentially folded inside the, the temporal lobe. Uh, there's a religious related area, Christ, sin, Jesus, sins, translation, phrase, holy murder. Sorry about that. <laughs> there is a lot of murder in the Bible. And then immediately next to it is a science-related area, science, profound, fascinating atmosphere, <laughs> masses, heavens, cosmos, haunting. I, I would note that the religion-related area is slightly larger than the science-related area. But, uh, there are actually two areas that seem to be semantically selective for religious concepts and two that are semantically selective for uh, scientific concepts. And uh, several that are selective for numbers, many, many that are selective for sort of families and social drama and social relationships and so on. Um, so this is a very rich data set and model, and um, uh, I think it'll, uh, it's providing a good platform for, you know, for future research. Uh, it's not, however, a perfect model yet. There are some problems with it. For example, here I'm, uh, I have starred all of the brain areas where murder is one of the concepts that is predicted to elicit the highest amount of brain activity. Now, you know, murder is an important social construct in humans, but I don't think you really need 25 brain areas to deal with the concept of murder. Uh, this, this actually is a, a failure of the model because the model really isn't complicated enough. Even though this is a 985 dimensional semantic space, anything that the brain is doing that is correlated with these 985 semantic dimensions gets projected down into this semantic space. This is the same uh, that happens with any task related MRI experiment we ever do, right? If I, if I use a localizer and I'm discriminating faces from places, it doesn't matter what the brain is doing, it's going to either be responsive to faces or places or nothing. Those are your only three options. Here you've only got 985 options. So that's one problem we need to, we need to deal with. A second is um, that you, know, you may not believe in this uniform area model where all of the voxels inside an area do the exact same thing. You may favor, say, a more gradient-based model where there are smooth transitions across cortex. And the pragmatic model in its current form doesn't do that, although there are extensions to the model we're building that will do that. And finally, I should point out that um, tasks actually change semantic selectivity. We don't have the data on this from stories yet, but we have data from a paper we published last year where people were watching movies. They're watching movies and we fit, uh, say, a thousand dimensional semantic model to the objects and actions in the movies. And now I've just color coded uh, each voxel on these flat maps according to its semantic selectivity. The, the code doesn't matter here. Um, and this is the baseline on the upper left. Down here on the lower left is when you're searching for humans in the movies. And down here on the lower right is when you're searching for vehicles in the movies. And I should mention that all the humans and vehicles were removed from the data set before these semantic selectivity uh, calculations were made. So what's happening is the semantic tuning for these voxels when people are watching movies is changing depending on what the people are searching for. And that means that there's a task variable, a task-related hyperparameter that's conditioning the, the response space of the voxels. And that makes things more complicated. We have no way to deal with that in the pragmatic model as yet, but it's a very interesting uh, direction for future research. So uh, I should just mention, since uh, I think Rainer's going to talk about this, is uh, I am very, very excited about the prospects of getting column scale MRI because right now I think our voxels are way too big and this uh, voxel-wise modeling approach will be very, very valuable when the voxels are become more selective because we're sampling from a smaller volume of brain tissue. So I, I really think that the future of MRI, of all sort of interesting uh, MRI, is going to be at high field. Um, so watching movies uh, or listening to stories evokes activity across broad regions of cortex. Um, the representations are complicated. Uh, it looks like maybe there's about 250 cortical areas, 120 or so in each hemisphere that, that uh, essentially represent semantic information in the stories of one form or another. Uh, we don't know how the interpretation will change with richer features, and we don't know how stable the tasks are going to be. So I'd just like to point out Alex Huth. This is the uh, gentleman that did the semantic modeling and the pragmatic model. And this is Lydia Majur. She's uh, doing the syntactic model. Thank you very much for your time.
So there is time for one question, actually, provided that you can speak pretty loud. <laughs> Bea. Uh, is it, are, you, are you asking a question about the model or about the brain? Either well, one. Ultimately, you want a brain to map onto the model. Exactly, exactly. So in, so in the brain data, our general rule is, you know, never smooth unless forced to, so everything gets done at the voxel level. That's essentially our, our sampling rate. So we're, we're limited by the TR of the magnet, which, uh, which defines our temporal sampling and the voxel resolution. Uh, in the model case, we actually, for this uh, semantic model, for example, I think Alex probably spent six or eight months optimizing this model. Um, it's a very, uh, it's, it's the model that rings the most variance, predictable, explained variance, out of the data as possible um, without making Alex drop out of science and leave because he's going crazy, right? That's <laughs> essentially, you know, you're not, you're, you're, you're not done with this job until you're predicting 100% of the explainable non-noise variance in the data, right? But what ends up happening is it's a case of diminishing returns, you know, the square root of n rule. So it becomes more and more difficult to beat the model the farther you go down the modeling pipeline. And eventually, you just reach a point where you just say, I, I, I'm not going to be able to get anything more out of these data. And that's, that's essentially where we are here. But uh, I should mention that this experiment and most experiments using natural movies or natural stories or any naturalistic task, they're always limited by um, your signals and noise in your data, of course, but also by how thoroughly you sample the stimulus space. And the stimulus space here was only two or three hours of movies. So really, we haven't, excuse me, two or three hours of stories. So we haven't really sampled the semantic space very well in our fit set. And that's really limiting what we can test. Thank you. Very short, if you can be very short. Yeah. Um, just a question, because you started up with the two models, the semantics and the syntactic one. Yeah? And you now ended up with the dynamics and semantics we all are aware of. Also, we know that there's no independence between syntax and semantics. So my question now is, would the syntactic model be a predictor to explain actually the semantic shift you will encounter in your data on the semantic? Level? That's an excellent question. So uh, the questioner points out that syntax and semantics are not two different things. They're more like two ends of a continuum. And in fact, these models are very covariate, um, but, but not entirely so, right? So there are some places in the brain that seem to work better with the syntax model. Some places in the brain work better in the syntactic, semantic model. But one of these models is essentially just measuring the covariances in words, and one is measuring the transition probabilities between words, which are kind of different kinds of information. So I think, actually, that there, these models should co-predict each other, and there, there might well be interesting structure in the task-related variables that relates to one or the other of these models. That's a, that's a huge kind of area of, of work. It's a really good point. Yeah. OK. Thank you very much.